So welcome back, everybody. We are starting a new series. This is called The Salvation of All. A couple of weeks ago, we finished a series up on, um, on hell, which talked about how hell is not what everyone thinks it is. It's not eternal torment. It's rather a time of judgment and chastening, which, when it's completed its work, results in the salvation of all. This is truly the good news and the ultimate plan of God in, this, from, in the scriptures declared from Genesis to Revelation. It's just that a strong delusion has gone out into the world that turn the truth into a lie. And that it's absolute foolishness in the world and in the churches to talk about the salvation of all. It's mocked as a foolish plan when that truly is the way the Lord is going to work. So hopefully through this study... Um, what I want to do is just demonstrate thoroughly from line upon line, precept upon precept, from Genesis to Revelation, that this is the truth of the scriptures. So if you've never heard this before, if you've had doubts before, just I encourage you to diligently study these scriptures, look up the words, the Greek, the Hebrew, and pray for the Lord to give you eyes to see, because this is what his word is saying. So let's get started here. <clears throat> the vast majority of Christians today believe that God is going to burn many people in hell by torturing them for all eternity. It's actually considered a great heresy by many that God would have mercy upon all men and eventually bring all the salvation. I firmly, I firmly believed this doctrine of eternal torment and was very motivated to tell others uh, what I thought was the good news of the gospel of God. The gospel that some will be saved and some will burn forever in hell is not good news, but rather a twisted and heretical view of God's glorious plan of salvation. The truth is that from the very beginning, God planned to redeem every person he ever created, in addition to the spirit realm, angels, demons, and yes, even Satan himself. In this study, I'm going to show you in great detail from the scriptures how God has hidden this plan to restore all things behind the types, shadows, and symbols of the Old Testament. And then we're also going to look thoroughly at the New Testament and see this demonstrated there as well. Acts 3, 20 and 21 says, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The law was given as a shadow of good things to come, which are revealed through Christ and the Spirit of God in the New Testament, Hebrews 10.1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can neither with those sacrifices which are offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. This great mystery has been hidden from ages and generations, but now is being manifest as Paul explains in Colossians. So before we go there, back in Hebrews 10, the law, you know, referring back to the very beginning of the things, even the, just the law of Moses, is going to thoroughly demonstrate that this has been the plan, it's just hidden inside of the sacrifices and the feast days and all the intricacies in the Old Testament. When you used to read that in Bible class and just be bored to tears, is because we didn't understand what it was really saying. And I'm going to show you what some of those things are really saying. And it's going to open up a whole new world of the scriptures and a depth that most have never seen before. This is Colossians 1, 26 to 28. Even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom would God make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The truth of God restoring all things is hidden behind the dark sayings and parables of his word, which without the spirit is impossible to understand. This is Psalm 78, 2. It says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. In 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, an account 
that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them, in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, that means to twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. The scriptures are difficult to understand because God has written them to conceal the truth until the appointed time. Proverbs 25, 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. <clears throat> and as we go through this, I'm going to deal with some common objections that come up. Many people think that if you're going to have salvation of all, that it's just greasy grace. Oh, we'll just do whatever we want and everyone's going to be saved in the end. And what the end of the hell study reveals is that this, there is judgment. And saying that there's salvation of all doesn't mean there's not judgment. Everyone goes through the exact same process. And those are some of the things that the churches of the world that do teach universal salvation don't understand that. So they teach restitution of all things, but they also teach do whatever you want. You're going to be saved in the end. It doesn't matter. So just kind of live it up. And that's not the truth of the scriptures. And that was one of the objections I had when first hearing about this doctrine. And the reason I first rejected it was I knew that we had to obey God. And I knew he had to be just and he wasn't going to tolerate sin. God spoke to people through parables in the Old Testament to keep the mystery hidden. And then did the very same thing in the New Testament through Christ. This is just how God works. Ezekiel twenty forty nine. Then said I... Ah, Lord God, they say to me, does he not speak parables? In Ezekiel 24, 3, And utter a parable unto the rebellious house, and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, set on a pot, set it on, and also pour water into it. In Matthew 13, 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. but to them." It is not given. Only those that God gives eyes to see will see this now in this life. Everyone will eventually see this and be saved, but there's an order in which he does it. This is Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see you indeed, but you perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. It's impossible through our own carnal reasoning and human understanding to see the mystery hidden behind the letters of the scripture. It's only through the Spirit of God dwelling in us that we are able to see the truth of his word. This is 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Until the Lord gives that spirit, when you first hear all men are going to be saved, Satan's going to be saved, people like you know Hitler and Mao Zedong and all these terrible people we think of, that they're going to be saved, it sounds ridiculous to the natural man, and he despises it. And we persecute the truth and reject it with violence, just as Paul did. With the um, when he first heard of Christ's message of salvation and opposing and or reforming the the old covenant, John sixteen thirteen. How be it when he the Spirit of Truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, he, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. So when God sends His Spirit through Christ, to bring it to us, it's what leads us into truth. And until we have that conversion, until the Lord comes to us on our, you know, our spiritual Pentecost, we're not going to understand these things. They're not going to make sense. And we're going to reject them and trample on the pearls. So I hope and pray that God will give you his spirit and that you may understand the true gospel and comprehend the marvelous plan of God. Paul prayed the very same thing for the Ephesians to whom he preached the truth of God. This is Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. 
that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Isaiah tells us that none but God knows what he has prepared for those that wait on him. Isaiah 64, 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither has the eye seen, O God, besides thee, what he has prepared for them that waiteth for him. So in the old covenant and all the prophets, none of them saw the mystery. None of them. I mean, everything from Moses to Abraham on all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, none of them knew the mystery. Yet Paul reveals that by God's Spirit, the deep things are revealed to us. And when I say us, I mean the elect, those that God is choosing now and working with to, to call out as his royal priesthood, to, to be his disciples and bring this message to the world in due time. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. But that it, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So normally people only quote verse 9, and they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, but they, they forget to quote verse 10 that says, but God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Well, who gets his Spirit? It's only his elect right now. Nobody in the Old Covenant, nobody in the Old Testament received the Spirit. God worked through them to accomplish certain things, working through Christ, but they did not have a spiritual mind. They did not understand the mysteries that were revealed after Christ's death and resurrection, and he came back to bring the Spirit of the Father. So I hope and pray that the Lord will use this paper to confirm what he's showing you through the Spirit. There are many difficult verses to understand and many scriptures that seem directly contradictory to one another. And our, when, when we're in our carnal understanding. I ask that you first please read the study entitled, Hell is Not Endless Punishment. Because I need you to clearly understand that eternal torments in hell is not spoken of in the Old Testament and certainly not taught by Christ or any of the apostles. This study addresses many verses that seem contradictory to the salvation of all, especially the word translated as eternal is a huge stumbling block. So once you can get over that hurdle, you're going to be able to receive the true good news of what's revealed in, in this study. This study addresses um, many verses that seem contradictory with the salvation of all. With, this foundation, with the foundations laid in, in the hell study, you'll be better prepared to appreciate the magnificence and beauty of the true gospel of God hidden in the Old Covenant and masterfully revealed in the New Covenant. So please take the time to be diligent and go back and go through that so that you can understand um, what I'm saying. I understand there's a lot of emotion. Many of us have been raised in churches that taught these things our whole lives. And so to, to, to even question the doctrine of, of eternal torment or salvation of all almost feels like you're changing your religion. I had, I had someone say that just recently. And so just don't make the decision based upon what people have told you. Look up the verses. Do you know what the Greek word for eternal is? If you don't, you need to know because it's not what you think it is. There's information that's missing. My people perish for lack of knowledge. So be diligent and go get the knowledge. Don't just believe what your pastor tells you. All right, so we're going to start in the book of Genesis and, and start revealing this plan of all from the very beginning. Very early in the book of Genesis, God gives us a prophecy of what will happen to the serpents because he has tempted Eve to transgress the first law which was ever given. This is Genesis 3, 14 and 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, but thou shalt bruise its heel, his heel. The Hebrew word for bruise is this uh, H7779, and is the same word translated as crush in the following verse, Job 9.17. Um, 
this says, for he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. What happens if a snake bites your heel and then you crush its head by stomping on it? Your heel may be injured, you may limp for a little while, but the snake will die. This is actually a prophecy of the salvation of all. Once you're being given the ability to see the spiritual meaning of these symbols hidden behind the words of the Old Covenant. Hebrews 2.14 says, For so much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also might himself likewise to partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So here is an article about the salvation of Satan that goes through in detail in the scriptures how Satan is actually saved, the process at which it happens, and the verses that support that. It's quite interesting to notice that the death and hell, that, that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. The Greek word for hell here is Hades, which is equivalent to the Hebrew word Sheol, which means the grave or the place of the dead. This is Revelation 2014. And death and hell, which is the word Hades, the grave, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. There's no longer any need for a place of the dead if, the, if death has been destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So are you following the logic here? If death is destroyed, where do you, why do you need a place for dead people? Well, you don't. It's Hell is emptied because all are saved. And when I say hell, it's the grave, not a place of eternal torment. It's the, it's the, uh, the spiritual abode of people that are spiritually dead. We must remember that the scriptures are full of dark sayings and parables. In a parable, there is a deeper meaning behind the words. So we must look beyond physical death and search the scriptures for a spiritual definition of death. And we can find it in Romans 8, 6. It says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So there will be no physical death anymore, and no one will have a carnal mind. The carnal mind is the opposite of the mind of Christ and represents all that is evil and rebellious in our mind. The lake of fire into which death and the grave are cast is a purifying fire that burns up all that is carnal and disobedient to God. Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In 1 Corinthians three fifteen, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. That's so important. Fire saves. It saves by destroying what is evil. Our works are burned, which means that we are taught through God's judgment to forsake all wickedness and self-righteousness, yet we are saved. This is the means by which God accomplishes the salvation of all through judgment. This is actually the last of the milk doctrines listed in Hebrews 6. And there's, a, there's a, a detailed study here on the milk doctrine of eternal judgment. And it really should be better translated age-lasting judgment because it's not eternal. It only lasts for a prescribed period of time sufficient to destroy all evil within each person. So again, go back, listen to the hell study. I deal with a lot of the verses that, you're pro that are probably popping into your head right now if you've never heard this before. They're all dealt with. There's an answer and it harmonizes all the scriptures. Christ tells Peter that the power of hell, which is Hades, will not prevail against the church. Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades, shall not prevail against it. This relates to Hebrews 2, 14, which explains that the devil, who has the power of death, is destroyed. Hebrews 2, 14. For so much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now, we're going to see as we go through the study that actually the destruction of the carnal mind is the creation of the new spiritual mind. So when it says Satan is destroyed, the devil is destroyed, 
Spiritually speaking, it doesn't mean that he's annihilated and no longer exists. It means that his old ways are destroyed, but he himself, Satan, is even saved as yet by fire, just as everybody will be. That's what the lake of fire, that, that death and hell and Satan and everyone else that's not in the first resurrection is cast into, accomplishes. That fire accomplishes the purification. So continuing on in Genesis, we find that there is a tree of life symbolizing salvation through Christ, but it's guarded by cherubim with flaming swords. This is Genesis 3.24. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east end of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life, to keep or to guard the way of the tree of life. In John 14.6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There's only one way to get to the Father. There's only one way to get to the tree of life, and that is to go through the flaming sword wielded by the cherubim. I'm going to explain this. Keep in mind that the mystery is hidden behind these symbols of the Old Testament. So let's start with a sword. What does a sword symbolize? Let's look, let's look to the New Testament to understand the mystery. Ephesians 6.17 And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So right there, comparing spiritual with spiritual, the sword wielded by the cherubim in the garden is the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, even piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God is used to divide soul and spirit. The word for soul is suke, G5590. This is the same word translated as life in the following verse, Matthew 10.39. He that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So again, that's the word suke. That word is often translated as soul as well. In this case, life represents our old sinful ways that we must lose in order to inherit true life, symbolic of our carnal mind. It's all the same thing. So the word of God is actually used to divide our old sinful ways from the truth taught by the Spirit of God that is sent to dwell within us, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they may know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So at first, we're living in rebellion, like Satan, for example, in sin, not knowing the true doctrine, not obeying it. And then as we're judged through fire, and the word is revealed to us, we begin to be conformed to Christ's image and begin to do these things that he teaches us, thereby coming to know God and Jesus Christ, which is salvation. The sword that is guarding the tree of life is on fire, because the word also purifies us. This is Malachi 3, 2 to 3. It says, But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. And he shall stand as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. If we're going to come to know Jesus Christ and eat of the tree of life, we have to pass through the flaming sword. We have to be caused to be obedient to the word, which is going to destroy our old man and our old ways. So who is it that is given to eat of the tree of life? Revelation 2.7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the key word there is, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. Overcoming is about overcoming the wicked one, 1 John 2, 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. If the wicked one, Satan, is destroyed, then everyone is going to overcome him, and eat of the tree of life. Hebrews 2.14 2, For so much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, talking about Christ, took, partook of the same, that through 
death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Later in Genesis, Abraham is told that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. Genesis 22, 18. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And Genesis 26, 4. And I will make my seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. This too is a prophecy that all men shall be saved. Paul explains in Galatians 3 that God will justify the heathen, which is, just means Gentiles, those that are not um, a part of Israel, by faith. <clears throat> Galatians 3.8 and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Israel has been mostly blinded from the truth until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. But then all of Israel will be saved. This is Romans eleven twenty five to 26 For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you also be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Sion a deliverer, and it shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So Paul goes on to explain how God uses the unbelief of some to give mercy to others. The result in the end is that he has mercy upon all. Romans 11, 30 to 32. For as ye in times past have not believed, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they may also obtain mercy. For God has included, concluded them all in unbelief that he may have mercy upon all. So, again, as you notice, I'm going through the study. I'm just reading the scriptures. You know, I'm not twisting this or making this up. I'm just reading the verses. They're right there. And there's just so many things, if you've never considered this before, that you just you pass right over and you don't notice how many times God talks about the salvation of all. The story of Joseph and his brothers is a powerful example of the mercy that God will have towards us, despite the fact that we have persecuted and spiritually killed his son and his people that preached the truth to us. And Joseph had a dream that was true, yet he was hated for it. Genesis 37.5 And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they yet hated him the more. He prophesied that his brothers, his mother and father, would bow down to him one day. When the opportunity presented itself, Joseph's brothers cast him into a pit and then sold him into slavery. This is Genesis 37, 23 to 28. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty where there was no water in it. So the reason he got the coat of many colors is his father had favor on him, just as God has favor on the elect and gives his true disciples, the knowledge, the understanding, symbolized by the coat of many colors. And what happens when the brothers who don't have this blessing find out about it? They want to persecute you. Uh, skip to verse 28. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. After many great trials and much suffering, Joseph is made the ruler of all of Egypt and stores up grain to save many from the seven-year famine. When his brothers come to buy grain for the family, Joseph torments them and then has great mercy upon them. This is Genesis 50, 19 to 21. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you fought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear you not. I will nourish you and your, you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. So what actually happened was when Joseph went through the, all of his terrible trials, suffering in Potiphar's house and then being thrown into jail and then eventually working his way up to where he was 
essentially ruling all of Egypt because he was given the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. He was the one responsible for executing everything that saved all these people from this famine. So Joseph's brothers didn't know that God had this all planned from the very beginning to save all these people in Egypt and in the surrounding areas. So too is God doing the same thing with his elect. He gives us the truth. We're persecuted for it. And then we go through these long seasons of trials, but we're actually storing up grain, spiritually speaking, all the truth, so that when the time comes, we can share that grain with others and actually deliver them from evil and save them. It's God working in us, of course, but he uses the elect to do that. Um, the story of God sending Joseph to make a way to save his family and many others is a shadow of the true salvation to come through Christ. While Joseph's brothers were hateful towards him and attempting to kill him, God was actually working their salvation. Now, again, his brother's salvation was a physical salvation from starvation. But remember, everything in the Old Testament is a parable. I mean, I mean it's a parable in the sense that there's a deeper meaning behind it, but the things still literally happened. I mean, these are still real stories. I'm just saying there is a spiritual meaning behind the letter. And this is exactly what God has done through Christ for us. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love towards us, that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And 1 John 4, 9 and 10. It was manifested, the love of God, towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. So think about Joseph being cast in the pit and sold into slavery is the exact same thing as the Jews that believe on Christ crucifying him. God planned it before the time began for the purpose of salvation. Now, salvation is brought to us through Christ and his body, that is so key, and his body, which is made up of those in whom Christ brings the Spirit of God to dwell. This is Colossians 1, 24 to 29. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up what is behind, that word means lacking, what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Those are some very dense spiritual words there spoken by our, our brother Paul the Apostle. And I, I wrote a whole study on just this set of verses that explains the mystery of the kingdom. Because the salvation of all, it's one thing to understand that it's going to happen. It's another to understand the mechanism, the details, and how God works it out. And, and this study goes through and talks about how God working through his body and his people works out salvation within each and every one of us over time as a process. It's not something that happens in a five-second sinner's prayer or you get baptized and you're saved. Salvation is much more difficult and labor-intensive and much more of a dragging, grinding process than that. It's, it's, it's a lot of work that the Lord works in us to get us there. So um, I'll also mention here that as I'm going through this study, I'm using a lot of principles that if you're new to this, you may not understand. Um, going to the sum of the word, comparing spiritual with spiritual, how to rightfully divide the word. You can go to my website, tryingthespirits.com, and if you can find studies under the, the Start Here section, it will take you through some of these concepts that you have to understand how to study the scriptures and biblically how the apostles wrote the scriptures and how they taught them is going to help you understand what I'm doing in this paper and how I'm pulling these things together and why this is the proper way to rightfully divide the word. So if you're new to this, don't be overwhelmed. Just go patiently and slowly. And uh, I love the little saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So this is a big elephant. So just one bite at a time. Just do the next 
diligent thing and the Lord will be faithful to, to reveal all this to you in time. So we're going to stop there for the night. Um, we're going to open up for any questions, comments. Whenever you guys are ready, just go ahead and jump right in here. Welcome, James. Can you guys hear me now? You're still very, very quietly. Huh. Well, I want to comment, Mitch, on uh, what what you read in Acts 3, verse 21. Uh, can you scroll back up there? The very beginning, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, right there. Yeah. It says, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution, which, times of restitution of all things, God spoke uh, by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. And I think it just behooves us to know what he's talking about there, because in Genesis 3.16 and in uh, Genesis 4.7, both of those deal with universal salvation right off the bat. And uh, we we don't get it because of the way it's worded in the King James and and in the other translation too, for that matter. But Genesis three sixteen is where God is talking to Eve, and He says, uh, "You'll bear children, and your desire will be toward your husband." In the King James, but it's against your husband. But the salvation is promised when it says, "And He shall rule over you." Because it's Christ ruling over us that's being um, uh, typified by the marriage, as we read in Ephesians 5. So that's that's a promise of universal salvation right there. And then it's more direct in chapter 4 and verse 7 where it says that uh, if you do well, talk God talking to Cain, he says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if, if not, sin, uh, sin dwells. At the door, is that how it's worded? Sin lies at the door, and uh, you shall bear rule over it. So there it is, two places in the very beginning, and then of course those examples you gave of Joseph and his brothers. You didn't do it; God did it, and. Uh, and at the end of the book of Genesis, he says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it unto good, so that much flesh could be saved alive, as you see this day. So his brothers were the ones that typify those that sold Jesus. They sold him for 20 pieces of silver. Christ was sold for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, they are the type of those who turn against Christ and crucify him, in other words, all mankind. And Joseph says they will all be saved to life. So just, it's just all through the Bible, especially right there at the beginning. Well, I really appreciate you adding that, Mike. There's just so many examples. It's just, it's just everywhere, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Steve, go ahead. Un unmute yourself, and I see your hand up there. Yeah, I'd just like to... Add you know some more scriptures of what uh, what Mike was just saying, and this is uh, uh, some of the scriptures that you were using in Colossians. Maybe it should go up a little further. This is uh, Colossians uh, one sixteen, and for by him are all things created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And this is twenty, and having uh, made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Oh, that's a great one, Steve. All things. Things in heaven and things in earth. It, it, it doesn't leave anything out. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things. Yes. Hmm. And that would include Satan. Yes.
And just know it's so, you know, especially if you watch turn on the news today and you see all the evil going on in the world, you know, you see these, these, you know, murders and rapes and violence and all these killings. That's where this starts to become foolish to the natural mind. And it's hard to wrap your head around how God could cause good out of all this evil. And, and the verse I've been thinking about a lot is, um, what's, what's the verse? This momentary light affliction. No, it's in Romans. Maybe it's in Corinthians. Second Corinthians 4.17 is, you know, our problem is our understanding is so limited. We don't see from God's perspective. But Paul, given the mind of Christ, says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now keep in mind, this is Paul. This is not a guy who's not been acquainted. He's been acquainted with suffering. He's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked. He's been beaten. I mean, he's been through physical suffering. You know, there. this is a time where Christians were literally killed, not just, you know, spoken negatively of against and sent out of the church. So when Paul says this, he knows what he's talking about. And he's saying even all the things he has been through, it's momentary and light compared to the weight of glory, the exceeding eternal weight of glory. So when, when we stand back from God's perspective, we're going to say, yeah, it's totally worth it. In order to well, reveal his glory, he has to do it through contrast of good and evil. And that's hard to grasp for the natural. It's impossible well, well, for the natural mind to grasp. Yeah, Paul, Paul is, uh, he's, he's contrasting you know, the, our physical life against uh, you know the spiritual he, he, because you know Paul says in you know other other scriptures that you know everything that's happening uh, to us he, is not to could be compared with the glory that you, you're going to receive mm -hmm. absolutely so that's in Romans Not to be compared. <clears throat> that is Romans 8.18. Which is actually a really interesting series of verses to read. Let's read those that down mm -hmm. to verse 20. He says, For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So yet another example of why is all this evil happening? Well, God has caused it so to subject us to vanity, to reveal the glory to everyone in due time. And when it's revealed... There will be an uncontrollable praise of the value and the worth of, of, of who God is and what he's revealing. Just We just can't. We see dimly now. We see darkly for our limited carnal minds and physical bodies. Anybody else have anything? No. All right. Well, I, I sure do appreciate everybody coming and adding to the uh, to the study here. I'm going to turn the recorder off and we can hang out in fellowship for a little bit. And we'll be back next week for part two.